Welcome everyone. I am delighted to host this keynote by Dr. Budermüller today as the, the chair. I would like to thank you, Dr. Budermüller, for taking your time. Uh, and you have been the CEO of BASF, one of the world's largest chemical companies for uh, since 2018. And you have been with the company for a long time. And you're also the president of the Euro uh, European Chemical Industry Council. So I think we will have a very interesting talk today. I will, uh, before we begin, I will uh, issue some technical guidance. We encourage everyone to ask questions uh, through the Q&A function. Please state your name and also maybe your background, where you're from, so we know who we're talking to. And um, with that, I, I uh, would like to hand over to you, Dr. Bruder Müller, and uh, wish us all a very interesting and insightful keynote and discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Leopold. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear LSE students. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me on this virtual stage. Um, it is my first event uh, um, of this traditional um, um, setup. Um, it's a very inspiring event. I have heard that from many people. Unfortunately, it's a virtual one. Um, in that respect, it also fits to your, to your motto, a new beginning. Um, uh, that is what, what COVID brings with us that we have to meet in that way, but there's also something good with everything. So I think the audience uh, and the, the, the group uh, being together today is most probably bigger than ever before when we meet uh, physically. So um, I have to tell you, I'm an optimist by nature, always was my whole life. And that's why also my classes are always half full. So I'm happy be, to be with you. And I think the glass has to be half full when you talk about the challenges um, in front of us. Definitely a big challenge if you want to talk in 15 minutes about such a huge thing like the Green Deal, not an easy deal, I have to say. So, but what I would like to do is to give you a bit the perspectives of um, the environment we are as industry in when it comes to the Green Deal and stimulate the discussion later. And I will tell you what our industry is doing and what BSF is doing to prepare for that. And then I really hope for a very lively and uh, challenging uh, discussion. So let me first say, always everyone thinks to have the biggest challenges ever um, since mankind exists. Um, and I think ex every generation thought about this and it's most probably even true because from their current perspectives with the state of the art knowledge, uh, it might indeed be the, the biggest uh, challenge. But I have to say, um, I'm leading now CEO as CEO BSF since two years, and I'm 31 years with the company. But all the leaders before me in BSF and in many other uh, companies have had actually their challenging uh, situations, and they have solved this with their knowledge at hand at that time. BSF is 156 uh, 56 years old and went through many, many challenges. And it always took a lot of boldness, entrepreneurship, leadership but also a lot of mindset change to get along and to cope with these challenges. What that gave to us over that years is confidence that we always master all the challenges. And I think this is very important when we talk about what is in front of us now, it has to become a company culture and it has become also DNA of BSF that we take up these challenges and we grow with them. Indeed, if we talk about climate change, I think it is the gigantic uh, challenge of humankind today. And I think we don't have to argue about it. There are still people in the society who argue whether this is real, but I think the evidence is striking. If you look on everywhere in the world, you see massive impacts and natural disasters at the same time, more often, more severe, and I have to say also more unpredictable. The scientific evidence, what's going on is striking. I think you cannot deny that. And for that reason, we have really to think about what our civilization and the model it operates, how that has to be changed and how we cope with these uh, challenges. And that is why I think our current model, how we live today will not work in the next decades with even some billion of people more on that planet. Uh, on that planet. That's why the title is also German industry at crossroads. I would say, yes, we are at crossroads, but it's not only German industry. It's global industry, and I would say it is finally new mankind that is on crossroads. So we all will feel the impact, but I have the benefit of being older than many of you, 
And the main challenge and the main impact is will, will be with you, the younger generation. That is also right why you voiced about that pro uh, problem and topic and you forced into change. At the very end, the European Commission took up that challenge and with the European Green Deal, I think we have one of the largest and uh, most challenging political programs ever. And it is Europe's political and societal answer for the future. And actually we should not forget that also a new model, how a future society actually should work. I think what impact we have to expect becomes clear by the word of Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. She said, just to mention the most important one. So we talk all over all very good ideas and I think the right guidance uh, for the future. But let me also say from an industrial point of view, but also from a citizen point of view, so far, these are all ambitions, dreams and wishes. I'm very engaged now in political discussion, both in Berlin and in Brussels. And I tell them all the time, that's like a flight in 15 kilometer altitude. All looks fine if you look down. But now comes the time to touch base and talk about the how. How to achieve these targets and survive and how we manage all these transformations smartly at the same time in a very competitive world. How do we ensure that the international competitiveness of European industry uh, is maintained in this period? So it is called the Green Deal, but in fact, it is more than green. We have to be clear, it has to be a sustainable deal in the sense that all the three legs, sustainability of sustainability, economic, environment, and social, have to hold and to be in balance. And we have to be aware only a healthy industry during this transformation can finance and shoulder this transformation. And it has also to arrive healthy at the very end of that journey in order to add value to people and the society. So what we need now for doing that is a totally new way of collaborating between society, politics, and industry. The how has to be translated into a very smart, new, positive, and incentivizing regulation and not how it is thought of many people that it has to be a transformation that is punishing, that is limiting, and that is actually enforcing. That is not going to work. And I think it will depend on this collaboration whether the Green Deal will be a success. So politics is not yet there. They are still in dreamland and they have really to come, by, to come down now and engage and talk about the how, how to make this happen. I don't tell you that because the industry is in a waiting mode and said, let's, do, uh, let's wait until they come up with these details and then we start. In fact, industry already embarked on that trip for a, for a long, long time. I have now only time-wise the aspect, uh, the, uh, the time to talk about one of these dimensions, which is actually the low carbon future. And that is something which is uh, not at all new for BSF because it was part of our considerations for a very long time. You know, maybe chemistry, chemical industry is one of the most energy intensive, and this is also one of the most carbon intensive industries. You might remember that from school when you were in chemistry lessons. Usually when you wanted to start a chemical reaction, you had always to heat up uh, the, uh, to make the, the reaction start. So BSF is the largest chemical company in the world. And with that respect, we have also a leading function. We call ourselves an action and the sword leader in the industry that was over, over the last 150 years like that. And we want to also maintain this and tell the industry and show the industry how to go into this transition. If you look on BASF globally, we emit 22 million tons of CO2, which is a lot, but it is only half of what we have been emitting in 1990, about 440 million tons. So you can see we already work since a long time in reduction of CO2. And it is pretty remarkable because at the same time we have actually increased our production volume by 50, by uh, doubled our in, um, production volume over that time. So if you look on a product, uh, one ton of sales product, we had 2.2 tons emission of CO2 in 1990, 0.6 in last year. And we are further going down because our corporate strategy includes that we want to grow carbon neutral until 2030, while we again want to increase our volume by another 50%. So we will reduce the carbon backpack from 0.6 
to 0.4 tons of CO2. So let me make this a little bit more tangible for you what that really means, a huge effort. Ludwigshafen is the largest chemical site in the world, which is in the property of one company. It's a huge, huge area, about 10 square kilometers. We have 35,000 people working there, another thousand, thousands of contractors. It's 3,000 kilometers of pipes. It is a huge integrated production site with 8 million tons per year. We have 2,000 trucks going in and out in the site and 40 ships on the Rhine every day. So it tells you it is huge. And it's 8 million tons of CO2. And to put that in perspective, it's about 1% of Germany. So we are relevant and we have to contribute. As I said, we are energy intensive. We have an energy need of about 55 um, terawatt hours uh, per year. To give you a perspective on that, that is like 2 million single family homes um, equivalent. So it is huge. So what we have um, done last uh, over the last years is to really fully understand where our CO2 comes from and how we best eliminate it. What are the technologies we need in order to tackle it and to, to address it? We have uh, put that together in a very unique program. We call it Carbon Management Program in BSF. And that is actually um, a bundling all the um, technologies uh, which has to come out of R&D in order to prepare ourselves to decarbonize. I'm a little bit shaking when I hear the word decarbonization because actually 75% of the carbon we buy is not CO2, but our products we sell. So if we would carbonize, decarbonize ourselves, we actually would have nothing to sell anymore. So we better call it carbon management. So now if you think about that, we are very energy intensive and uh, yet you cannot change thermodynamics. You can only think about what is the way to bring energy into the chemistry. We cannot get rid of it, but we can change the type of energy we actually use. And if you start to think about that, there's only one way to get rid of the CO2. It's electrification. So switching from fossil-based uh, raw um, um, heating um, materials to electric energy from renewable sources. That is uh, a, a huge endeavor because we need masses of uh, renewable energy, certainly at very low cost. Also here that you get an idea about the challenge. The German Industry Association for the Chemical Industry, the VCI, has actually done a study to calculate that the German chemical industry alone would need more than 600 terawatt hours in order to electrify completely. To put that in perspective, that is about three times as much of renewable energy production in Germany today. And I talk now only about the chemical industry. We, in the same time, we want to have e-mobility. We want to change heating systems in houses and convert all the other CO2 sources. So that shows you it's a huge endeavor. And uh, the chemical industry, in order to be successful, has to become access to huge amount of renewable energy. And this is why this is also key in the European plan that we need much more of these offshore wind parks, both solar um, farms and so on in order to generate and produce this uh, energy to make uh, the conversion happen. You can imagine if you do that, electricity prices are usually very high in Europe. It is challenging your competitiveness because fossil base is certainly much cheaper, even with CO2 prices increasing. So we need here the shoulder to shoulder approach with politics in order to fund um, also new technologies, but also talk about how we can get actually this, uh, the electricity prices uh, further down. And this is really uh, the challenge uh, going forward uh, and together. On the other hand, uh, very clear, you also want to have a better idea. What do you mean this electrification of, of chemistry? I'll give you one good example. You might know that in chemistry, everything starts with the steam crackers. This is very huge chemical intensive machines that are at the beginning of value chains. So you normally they, you take a hydrocarbons from a refinery with the long hydrocarbon change, you heat them to 850 degrees in presence of steam, and then the, the, the chains crack and you get small molecules, which are actually the building blocks to do for the chemical industry. You have to do that chemical reaction at 850 degrees Celsius. And what you normally do is these big ovens, they are heated by natural gas. 
And this natural gas generates about one ton of CO2 per ton of sales of a final product. That's a huge amount. So what you can do now, and BSF has developed uh, technologies over there, you can actually do that electrically. And you have to imagine that looks a little bit like a toaster. You have in these ovens no longer an open flame, but you have uh, glowing um, um, time to talk about hydrogen, which is very much in everyone's mouth. And it is a key ingredient, particularly if the hydrogen is produced from water electrolysis or methane pyrolysis, because then it's CO2 free. The ordinary process in chemistry is normally a process steam reforming where you produce one ton of hydrogen with 10 tons of CO2. So it is another very big lever to get rid of CO2. There are many, many more ingredients which I cannot uh, point to, but you can imagine if you want to go on that route, you need a whole bunch, a portfolio of technologies. Partially they are there, partially they have to be developed. And that is what we have in our carbon management program until 2030. We will go now in the first steps of pilot plants and then in the second half of the decade, will increasingly scale them up and with this then having also the effect to really reduce CO2. So that is the part we can do. But behind us, there are others in the chain. It's first of all our customer industries that use our products. They have to take care also for their own products to make them CO2 free. And then there is at the very end, the consumer, for example, you. If you really want that new future to happen, you have also to accept changes in your behavior. Because what is very clear already today, if we want to produce chemicals and the products of our customers CO2 free, they will be more expensive. That means overall spending pay pattern of consumers have to change. We have to accept that certain products have a different pricing, that we have different priorities in the consumption. And this is why it is very important for us to make this transition a success that we work with our customers on new business models. And what we have done, and this is a pretty remarkable exercise because it's also a, a digitalization challenge. We have actually 45,000 sales products in BSF that are coming out of this network, which we call Verbund. We have now a digital solution until end of the year, we will tell every customer for every ton of sales uh, of product they buy from BSF, what the CO2 footprint is. And then we will have projects with our customers where we can work with them over time to actually reduce the CO2 backpack. That, to give you an example here, if you read the homepage of Daimler-Benz, they say Daimler cars in 2039 are CO2 free. That is only possible if all the ingredients they buy are CO2 free. That means the steel they buy and also the chemical products and the polymers in the car have to be CO2 free. And these are the products our industry sells to the automotive industry. So we will work with our customers with all different methods to bring that CO2 um, um, footprint down. And this is also making the ultimate product consumers buy for the CO2 fry. And that goes from a shampoo to a mattress to a car. So, but it will only work if we accept that some cost structures will change and with this also some priorities maybe have to change. There will not be free lunch for anyone in this transformation. So it is not only on the crossroad for industry, it is on the crossroad for the whole value chain and ultimately for the consumer. So society wants to have that change and that is also the right address, but then you have also to jointly make this a success and it will only work jointly. So I'm an optimist that this works and someone has to go in the lead and BSF is definitely in our industry, I think most advanced to do that. We will um, also have now very distinct steps over the next months and years to come uh, that, that um, also to go forward. But it, it requires that we do not only dream of the EU Green Deal, which is a good chance, but that we have a brutally honest assessment about what it takes and who has to do what in order to make it happen. And it is partially painful. Let me also very clear, be very clear, it is a long ride. For BSF, that definitely means a transformation of several decades. We will need the time to become CO2 free until 2050. Now everyone talks about net zero in 2050. Clearly, I tell you as a CEO in charge of that company, 
I'm less worried about the last mile we have to go in 2045 to fully decarbonize in, until 2050. The real critical path is now, what is happening until 2025? What is happening until 2030? So it's more about the first miles and to take care about them. So we are very much committed to that. Um, I have to say, I said at the beginning, it takes mindset change, it takes leadership. And this is why, why it is also very important that uh, actually the CEO has to go ahead. And this is why me, myself as a CEO, I drive that change. And I see now also people in the company who are more in the old fashioned thinking, they change mindset. And by getting very clear targets from the very top of the company, it is interesting and it is actually amazing to see how our smart people we have start to think differently and how they come up now with great ideas and creative ideas to really change the company to something good. Let me close to say that the chemical industry is a very indispensable part. It is, we call it the mother of the industries because it is at the beginning of the value chains. Almost all manufacturing industries need somehow products from the chemical industry uh, to produce their goods. And if you think about the Green Deal, which has so much on its agenda, like for example, e-mobility, think about e-mobility. The crucial part is the battery. The battery is nothing else than a chemical reactor. It will depend on how good that chemical reactor is, how much um, electric cars will be accepted by people. Think about windmills. They get bigger and bigger. They need new materials from the chemical industry. Think about housing, insulation materials. This is all products from the chemical industry. So it is about our innovation force for our products we offer, but also our own responsibility to get rid of CO2 during our process. So that's a very ambitious plan, but it is also something uh, where I can see that slowly everyone joins in. Uh, creates a lot of enthusiasm in my own company. Employees are proud that we go that way and customers are joining. So we started to embark on that in a big, a little bit in a nutshell now for you in 15 minutes. And uh, let me say that uh, that is an opportunity also for BSF to differentiate because I think those who are first and faster, they create the competitiveness of tomorrow. And I'm deeply convinced if we do it right and we join forces, we will make this energy transition towards the net zero world in the same moment competitive. And then this is the future of Europe. My company brings that together with our purpose, which is we create chemistry for a sustainable future. And I think that expresses what our mission is, what our dreams are. And with this, uh, let me close here. And uh, I think I'm a little bit over the 15 minutes, but uh, thank you very much for listening. And I hope I brought you up for a now a very uh, lively discussion. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Dr. Budemüller, for that very insightful uh, keynote. And uh, it's nice to see what you do at BSF. Um, I would like to ask a very, the very first question about um, this dichotomy that we had in the past between the environment and industry. And usually when we had environmental regulation, the industry was opposed to it. And now we have this, the case where the industry is actually embracing this change. They are embracing the um, carbon, uh, yeah, carbon 2050 goal by, by the EU. Um, but I would like to draw the attention to other environmental problems as well. So if we look at biodiversity loss, it's also a very challenging problem. And it's also part of this green deal by the EU. So I would like to ask the question whether, whether it could also be a, a, an opportunity for, for the chemical industry to incorporate other environmental issues such as biodiversity loss into their um, yeah, company uh, policy and company uh, purpose. Actually, Leopold, we have to do and we do that. Um, I mean, as I said, for time reasons, I only talked about the energy transformation. We, in the same moment, have many other transformations. We have to go away from fossil raw materials into bio-based. We have to address circular, which means we have to close the loops because a lot of the value chains are actually open. And so you, you have waste and you dispose it. And we all know about the plastic waste where a lot of this plastic materials is finishing up in oceans, which is a disaster. Um, so this is all ha has to happen at the same time. Also, if you look about uh, agricultural um, uh, and farming uh, topics, it's indeed about diversity, uh, but diversity. It is about digitalization. It's about less chemicals on the field. So that all has to be addressed at the same time. 
So that makes it also so challenges and challenging. And uh, actually what we need uh, also with the politicians, it is impossible to do all at the same time. We need a little bit also about priorities and, and uh, talking about what should come first. And as I said, if you do regulation well, and you do a regulation that enables, then you actually generate a framework that helps the industry to go fast with the transformation, but stay healthy and competitive and earn money, which you can reinvest into this transformation. So, and I think the art is indeed, as you said, to drive this multi-dimensional uh, transformation in a coordinated way and not uh, by everyone is running for his or her targets and mine are important than the other ones. And that's a bit where I have to say the Euro European Commission has to come a little bit closer to each other uh, to do that. And that is what I am as a CEFI president now currently trying to orchestrate for our industry, that we have a more holistic discussion. We need a kind of a long-term plan for the chemical industry and certainly then also for other players in this whole system. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I would like to ask the second question also relating to what you just said about we need a coordinated, coordinated effort. Um, and we all know that climate change is a global problem which, which needs a global solution. Um, but what is your response at, um, towards actions from countries or developing countries that have much less stringent um, regulation in terms of climate change policies? Um, and do you see do you see the role of a private company like BA, BASF to, to actually contribute to a global common framework? I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the ideal world for a global company like ours and in terms of competitiveness would be to have a level global, a global level playing field. That means we have a coordinated global strategy and, and measure set for, for a climate, against climate change. This is unfortunately not the case. So, but that's fact and we have to deal it. What cannot be the case is by saying, because some countries don't address it, we also don't address it. Someone has to go in the lead. And this is actually what the Green Deal does and I appreciate that. But what we can also not do is to forget about competitiveness. We are in a global world. What you heard now is that the European Commission thinks about the so-called border adjustment measures. That means knowing that some products are getting more expensive we somehow have great frictions at the fence and we say, okay, we have to protect our products and products that coming out in from, from others have to pay duties at the border. I think it's the wrong program because actually what we do is we are against the WTO, I think, and we also protect Europe like a castle. No one can come in and out. So that doesn't make sense. That's why I said the regulation has to come in that we do the transformation while keeping the, the, the competitiveness. And I think it is possible. If we look on the world, what you just described for BSF, a company like ours globally, we have all everywhere the same standards. Whether we go to a, uh, an emerging country or the US or to China, we have always the same standards, how we build plants and how we protect the environment. So there is no kind of level two, three or four. Uh, that means we have also to deal with our standards in markets that are more competitive, but that worked very well. And if you look, for example, in China, I think BSF is the largest foreign investor in the chemical industry over there. We have actually took, taken a lot of impact on the EHS level China has today. And it's also very much acknowledged that basically BSF taught a little bit the industry how to level up uh, uh, in terms of standards. So for that reason, we cannot uh, complain about uh, not having a global CO2 price. We have to actually live with it. But let me make one last statement. The EU thinks now with the Green Deal, they have something very special no one has. If you follow up the news, China has actually committed to peak in their emissions in 2030 and to be net zero in 2060. And the US with the Biden administration will also to step up their efforts on climate change, which is great. And they go back to the Paris Agreement, but that means Europe will get a lot of competition also from other areas in the world. And that's why I think we better be fast and we better also talk to others because I think it is very much about collaboration also with other uh, countries. And we might then uh, also come to the agreement that we have a bit, a broader setup of rules, not only for
Now you're back. Okay, and I think I just lost you there for, for a minute. Um, yeah the internet connection. Um, okay, thank you very much. Now we turn to the Q&A. We have some very interesting um, interesting questions here. The first one is from Antonia Kempf. Um, she's asking, considering that BASF wants to electrify its production, how will you tackle an increasing volatility in the energy market? And what, what role does energy flexibility play in that context? Oh, Antonia, that's a very... Um... Very interesting and very smart question. You're indeed right. If we come to an increasing uh, share of the renewables, we have to be very clear. We have dark and uh, wind-free times. That means neither solar nor actually uh, uh, um, wind will produce any energy. This is why we need much more capacity. We need to talk about storage. And we have now somehow to flatten, let's say, the oscillating uh, production. And uh, with this, you can imagine that certain chemical reactions can actually be that buffer. You only produce certain chemicals once you have an excess of energy. And I think that is exactly also the mechanism which you need in order to make costs more predictable. Because it cannot be that if something is short, you actually have then the double or three times as high electricity costs. So that is something that goes certainly far beyond BSF. That is something that has to be addressed also by politics by regulation, what is actually the system, how you find the market price in a world that is mainly driven by renewable energy. So it is another huge uh, uh, challenge, but uh, I think it can be done. And there will be new technologies, very important, like uh, storage uh, that, that uh, will, will help us in doing that. Uh, one storage facility can, for example, be electric cars. You can imagine that uh, cars, for example, can be charged when there is excess uh, energy and uh, maybe they wait a little bit until the energy is placed in different uh, needs or different areas of the society. That comes back a little bit to what I said earlier. We have to change behaviors and we have to change systems and, and uh, rules and regulation. So that is another very important uh, part of that journey, but uh, I think it can be done. Um, there are other examples where this has been done already. So um, it is something that definitely is not only a German issue, it's, it's also something that the European community on, had to address on the European level. All right, thank you. Now we have another question, or another question. Um, Matt Meyer from the Helmholtz Zentrum Berlin. He's asking, Dr. Brudermüller, as you mentioned, most of your products are carbon-based. Eventually, nearly all of that carbon will become CO2 again, whether by combustion or slow decomposition, sometimes decades after the raw chemical was sold. Thus, this end of life carbon must also be managed. Who should bear the responsibility for this, the chemical product manufacturer, the consumer or the government? Well, it's a very good question. I mean, first of all, we certainly try to reduce that. You will see over the time that uh, there will be a diversification of the raw materials. Um, today, very much is fossil. But uh, you partly see that moving into bio-based uh, materials that then per se by being bio-based, they also close the loop. And then you have also recycling. We call that chem cycling that for example, plastic material that is used is basically puralized and then converted back into a kind of an oil, which you then can start uh, to do chemistry with at the very beginning of the value chain. So with this, you will see that carbon that ending in, in straight linear value chains going down over time. But let's be very clear. I mean, we will have also material that is not recyclable. If you, for example, think we produce a dispersion for a paint uh, to, to paint your house, uh, you cannot take the paint up uh, off anymore and to recycle it. So we will have uh, systems where we still have the, 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 the straight uh, way. And then we have to talk about the, the CO2 pricing. And I said this at the very beginning. I mean, consumers have also to take their share uh, because certain consumption behaviors have to change. Or if someone does certain things, has then also to carry the cost uh, for CO2. And uh, certain company compensation most probably has to go also via, for example, reforestation. Um, these kind of, of things where you then take the CO2 from the atmosphere and basically bringing down to, to uh, bio-based materials. So it will be a complex uh, um, uh, framework. And uh, we have then to see what the burden is who someone creates. And with this also pay at the very end the CO2 cost. But it's very clear at the very end. 
the consumer pays everything. You cannot expect that the industry somewhere in between digests something. Yes, margins go down. Maybe you have a lower EBITDA margin in future. I don't know. But at the very end, the cost has to come with the consumers. And I think this is also where the ultimate consumption is. And it's, it's, it's right like this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, also touching on what we had earlier about the environmental, um, environmental emissions besides CO2, uh, we have a question from Maximilian Pott. Um, so industrial wastewater from chemical production poses a great threat to the environment. What solutions and maybe very precise solutions do you see to reduce polluted water contaminating clear water? Well, Maximilian, I think it's not such a big problem because it is handled very, very clearly and transparently today. So we, for example, in Ludwigshafen, we have one of the largest wastewater plants in the world. It's not only taking, by the way, the wastewater of our Ludwigshafen site, it is also taking the municipal um, wastewater from two or three cities around us. And uh, with this, it goes through the, the, the steps of mechanical, chemical and biological treatment. And we have very clear uh, understanding what is actually happening there. I think what is important, and maybe what you what you um, tip on is water management overall. And this is all why by BSF is uh, very advanced in water management. You have also areas where you operate where water is scarce, and where you actually have to trim your processes that you le use the least amount of water you can, or within the chemical process you already recycle water to need as low as possible volumes of fresh water. So we have just recently been got, got a, a very good award and recognition for being advanced in this. So, but I would say that is not a critical problem. Uh, I mean, wastewater treatment is under control, but uh, you have to look at your responsibility in areas where the water is needed for other purposes, be it farming or be it the living of people. I think that is the crucial topic. Okay, thank you. Um, now a question from Andrew um, he, from Bloomberg. So uh, BM, BMW today announced a large contract for the first aluminium produced using solar power from Emirates Global Aluminium for their electric vehicles platform. Do you, do you expect BMW to soon make similar demands on its plastic suppliers? It's very probable because I mean, um... This kind uh, of customers, automotive industry is the most important uh, industry, uh, customer industry of BSF, it's about 20% of our sales. And it's, by the way, also the most innovative industry, I have to say. This is why it is also so interesting, because BSF is an innovative company, too. We indeed talk about this, and this is what I said earlier. I mean, uh, I used the example of the car, I used the competition Daimler because they had uh, addressed it. Yes, they talk about this with us, and they say at a certain amount of time, you have to show us how you reduce the CO2. Because if our part that comes into a car, which is scope three for the car producer, it has to be CO2 free. And uh, I regard this actually as a huge opportunity because if you can offer products with lower CO2, you have actually a competitive advantage against your competitors. And normally these kind of products, which we call accelerator products, these are chemical products that have an advantage in terms of sustainability, we can prove they, they grow faster and they have higher margins. That means also our customers award, reward, that there is an extra benefit in these products. And this is exactly this kind of business models where I have been talking about. If we want to go there, this journey together, then also most probably they, they have to talk about uh, paying more. I would be very surprised if the alumina is not a little bit more expensive than the traditional alumina. But at the very end, this is the right journey. And this is the common and joint responsibility I was talking about. And it's actually a good example. You see that also a customer like a company like BMW cannot solve that problem alone. They need their suppliers in the value chain to reduce CO2 as they expect from us. I have to expect the same from scope three for BSF. So all who deliver products in BSF, I have to be the customer for them and say, you have to drive down your CO2 footprint. And this is what I was talking earlier. It has to be a joint effort. Everyone has to do its own accountability and contribution in the value chain to end up with final consumer products that have no CO2. And this, I think, a very good and tangible industry. It will go and it will touch all kind of industries associated with that. 
And um, just touching on your last point, do you see maybe um, the the chance that some industries or some certain firms won't take enough action and that there actually needs to be some form of punishment by, by the government uh, against firms that don't comply with those um, environmental well-intended um, strategies? Well, I think to be very clear, Leopold, I think every good company knows about this accountability. The challenges are different. I mean, you can imagine industries that are low CO2 intensive. They just buy a little bit of renewable energy and they are CO2 free. If you have a company like mine, which is so energy intensive, this is a much more cumbersome endeavor. But at the very end, I think we have mechanisms that drive the development. I mean, if you think about so-called ESG, this is uh, environmental uh, um, sustainability and governance issues that are driven now by investors. More and more investors don't want to give companies money who, for example, employ coal. They have very clear guidance and very clear expectations where they want to actually uh, invest their money. So that drives already, where do you get your capital from the capital market if you don't go on that journey of, um, of CO2 reduction? So um, there will be also media. You see, I mean, very quickly, if someone is doing something wrong, you have a or a shitstorm in the media. So no one can afford that. And I think there is pressure enough to uh, put uh, people and companies on the track to embark on their individual journey. And this is um, for the one more easy, as I said, than for, from the other one. But for that reason, I think we have enough mechanisms to put that journey uh, uh, into motion. Uh, to make it successful, I can only repeat myself, we need then also smart regulation. Because I think punishment is a bad advisor. If enforcement and enablement uh, can do the job, it is, is this the much better way and a much more positive way for everyone than punishing? Okay, thank you very much. Um, now we have a question which goes into a little uh, different um, direction. It's by René Reuter and he's asking, what is your take on BASF past? especially concerning its role uh, during or its role in Germany during National Socialism um, and uh, coming up with Cyclone B gas that probably helped make a lot of money that placed the company at a good position to keep operating until now. First of all, we have been very transparent with our history already decades ago. We have um, actually written also a book and we asked independent um, people um, with historical background to really work up what, what was the, 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 the position of, of the company. And I think we have reacted on that also very transparently and also uh, what, whatever we can do. We have refounded BASF after IG Farben as a total new footing. And I think what is uh, important is that we take also the maximum um, um, responsibility in order to avoid that anything like this in future happens again. And uh, in that respect, I think BSF um, has taken up its responsibility, reacted on that, and also contributes now uh, very clearly with the governance system um, to uh, move the world in the right direction. So um, I, I, you have to live with what happened in the history, but there is nothing we have ever been hiding or intransparent with. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, uh, a question from Norbert Reis, um, export HSBC Trinkhaus. Um, CO2 avoidance and capture needs to be profitable, profitable to come about. What incentives would you suggest to the political and regulatory world to make that happen? Well, I mean, as I said, I mean, we embarked in discussion. Let me make this very tangible. If, you, if, if we, for example, talk about renewable energy, it's interesting, uh, today, an uh, offshore wind park has a very competitive energy price for a kilowatt hour of, of uh, um, electricity produced. If you look on the German system, taxes, grid costs, other costs, and the so-called EEG uh, makes out of 5 cent almost 17 cent. If you try to electrify the industry with 17 cent, you lost the ground before you even start. And that is not international competitive. So when we have to talk with them, we have to talk about the whole system. Politics always likes to make a little bit here, a little bit there, and a little bit change of here. It's not doing the job. If you really want to manage this challenge, and this was why I talked the first five minutes about it, we have really to say, we need a totally new system for energy pricing. 
because that is exactly the enabling thing I talked about. If you have energy cost at five cent, and then a slowly arising every year a rising CO two price, you have actually exactly the right framework to do that. It is economically feasible and rational and logic to do certain transformations. Because if you do not, that's also the punishing element, you will be caught by rising CO2 costs that will add so much cost that you are no longer competitive. So with this, you basically have to use the technologies in the go in this journey. But we have to talk about such an enabling system. And I think energy pricing is a very good example here. If we think we should remain with the highest um, energy cost in the world, which is currently the case in Germany, we will lose that race. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from Simon Krause, student at the LMU. He's asking, Dr. Budermüller, has the pandemic accelerated the green transformation of your industry because it created more awareness for global crisis or is the opposite the case as the pandemic depleted some of your financial resources needed to finance the green transformation? So Simon, very good question. Very clearly can tell you it most, most probably overall in the world it accelerated. The normal thing would have been, and that was also what some people expected. Now they have the economic problem, societies uh, have bankruptcies and people have losing jobs. So uh, the environmental part is pushed aside and we get some time to breathe to do the old model. It's actually not happening. It's very interesting. I mean, all the companies, and as I said, also the international scene going towards net zero shows it's not actually uh, uh, stopping or decelerating this development. And it's also right, climate change will not wait. Even if we have uh, some 7% less global uh, emissions this year because simply of lower economic activity, people not traveling, not flying anymore, it doesn't change the overall threat from climate change. And I think what's happening now, and the EU is addressing this, that the money that is now spent on the recovery, they want this very rightfully be connected by doing the right things. And meaning to, if we invest this money to bring back economy to a more healthy level, then please invest it in the right technologies, in the technologies that already contribute to the different transitions I was talking about. And I'm actually very happy that, that this is the case, because as I said, I mean, uh, the climate change is not waiting. But what we need again is to talk about how we make it successful. So it's not only about now making debts, public debts, uh, several hundred billions and uh, the money goes in the wrong direction. That's why we need this interaction. But I would clearly say also in BSF, we had a lot of problems with COVID. You saw that also on our economic performance, but we have never ever stopped anything on, uh, on the sustainability track or the development or the R&D or the customer projects. We have actually even accelerated that. So, and I think most of the others I talked to, my, both my customers and others in the industry, they have actually done the same. And this is, I think it's a great message. Thank you. Um, now, a question from Tado. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Tado Caldas. Um, Mr. Brudermüller, thanks for a very interesting presentation. Could you please explain briefly what is for BASF the future of plastic? And are there actions for cleaning up and recycling the ocean, ocean's plastic pollution? Oh, that's a very, very interesting topic. And I get very emotional about it because um, I'm enthusiastically engaged in this. I mean, as I said earlier, uh, there is a public discussion now where the waste problem, particularly in the oceans, is actually bringing plastic to the point that people say plastic is a bad material. It's not the case. We mix two things. The one is a responsibility and a waste and a circular problem. And the other one is the material which has great properties. I can tell you if we would replace plastic in so many applications in daily life and would use alternative materials, the CO2 footprint would be much higher. If you take metal and wood and, and other things uh, for many applications, uh, it would not be, make us better in terms of um, CO2 burden. What we have to ensure is that the material is not landfilled and it is not somewhere dumped in the in the nature we have to close the loops and for that reason i think the address addressing the circular topic is exactly the right uh, thing to do just imagine for example if you would ban plastic think about the food chain if you look back 20 years there was a huge loss of of harvested fruits and vegetables until they came to the consumer 
you could throw away a lot of, of that part. Now you have, for example, very modern multi-layer films um, based on polyamide and other materials that protect the food in the chain much longer, it keeps longer fresh, uh, much less is, is actually damaging. And with this, it's also much more efficient. If we would take that away, we go back to actually back into Stone Age. I think it cannot be the solution to take innovative plastic solutions away. But what we have to do is to do the utmost approach to make it circular. And uh, for that reason, we very much support that. And um, also the waste issue, uh, there is the Alliance to End Plastic Waste. So BSF was one of the five founding members of the Alliance, very proud of that, but personally involved, where we have put together more than 1 billion US dollars from companies along the value chain to address projects uh, all over the world which are later scalable, how we can actually tackle and get our hands around um, um, about and concerning the, the pollution problem. So that's also not happening overnight, but I think we address it in, in, the, right, in, the, in the right way and uh, with this um, over time can close the loops. Okay, just following up on, on that question, um, we, we see that globally there, there are, um, are you know, the main problem in terms of plastic pollution in oceans are actually actually rivers in, in certain countries, such, such as China. And um, when you, you know, as BASF uh, talk about, you know, you want to fight against this challenge, um, like how actually effective can you be? That's the one question, because it comes down to other countries uh, or governments. And then following on from that is also wouldn't it be better if you make sustainable products in the first place or, or not not su sustainable but also um products or plastics that can be completely biodegradable so bioplastics thank you very much for that question here but i mean you you, you really addressed the, the the big problem i mean a single company has very limited impact i mean how should bsf clean the world it's impossible we can neither finance it nor we can engage in, in national legislation. What we can do is, and that brings me back to what I said at the beginning, also here, industry and governments and society have to collaborate. They have to join forces. And uh, at the very end, what we can do, and this is what the Alliance to End Plastic Waste does, we can offer solutions, test them, pilot them. And then if they are working, we can actually translate them and replicate them hundreds of times in local environments. If we do it right again, we will create jobs in areas where there are no jobs. For example, if you think that you have people in poor countries who collect uh, plastic waste uh, in, a, in a very systematic manner and bring it back as a raw material and they get reimbursed because the raw material has a value, you actually do not only close the loop, but you also generate socially uh, wealth and well-being and salaries for people. But that has to include a, a local government. They have to say, okay, I'm with my legislative framework contributing to this. You have to do in country A a little bit different than in country B. So this is why this is an, a joint effort. You are right when it comes to uh, product development. That's also what our innovation does. We always try to do solutions that are better than the last ones. But as I said earlier, if you have some products that are recyclable and it's part of the design of the value chain, we do that. There is material which our customers bring back and say recycle. That is the ideal thing. But you have also products which you cannot recycle. We, for example, have biodegraded material. It's, for example, foils. You put these so-called mulch foils, which you put in a field. You see that sometimes over winter time to protect. And they actually biodegrade. You put them, when the machine comes, they put them just under the soil and they, they degrade and it's fine. There's no waste left. But just imagine, do you want to have a plastic good which you want to use for five years to degrade? So you have usages where you don't want them to biodegrade because you want to have a long lifetime of the product. So it shows you, you have, don't have a one size um, fits all solution. But that's why we need the transparency about the application, about the, the material grades, about the needs of, uh, of the society and the customer, and if possible, close the loops. But it is unfortunately a very, very complicated discussion. I think the right way that comes now is to put the legislation uh, forward, to do all what I just said. And, and on the other hand, then uh, really also from a consumer point of view, um, also take over responsibility because it can mean 
that certain products you don't buy because you don't like what is happening with packaging material, for example, or the way it, it uses resources. We have to make it transparent and then consumers have also a choice. Thank you. And um, so we're slowly coming to a close, but uh, I have another question from Josephine uh, Altenburg. She's also a student at LSE. She's asking about the circular economy technologies for BASF. And I would just add for myself that um, if we look at Germany, for example, we have a very high recy recycling rates. Um, so the question here is, I mean, just recycling things doesn't um, doesn't solve the problem because in the end, still a lot of plastic gets burned in Germany, for example, for, for electricity. So kind of what is your take on these circular economy approaches and how effective do you think they are? I mean, first of all, uh, the recycling rate in Germany, if you look in the details, it's not so high than you think. There's also too much non-circular net. So we can be yeah, slightly better than many other countries, but it's not that we are the great guys in telling all the others in the world what to do. So there is a lot of effort also to do in Germany. At the very end, you have always to look for the best solution. It's definitely better to incinerate it and get the energy out of it than landfill. But we say the chemical recycling uh, is even better than the incineration because if you do a like, uh, life cycle assessment, uh, which we have done and we have also let some independent advisor look at it, it is from an energy point of view and from the CO2 point of view better to collect those plastic materials uh, which are not pure, which is mixtures, and then basically treat them uh, thermally, you, you heat them up and they basically me melt down and break the chains and become an oil fraction again. And this oil fraction you can actually put at the beginning of the value chain and produce the same high grade innovative virgin materials again. And I think with this, you neither lose the innovationness of the final product and the plastics, nor you end up losing any carbon in this. So for that reason, the, I always say the, the, the better is the, the, for, is the enemy of the good. And this is why incinerating was already better than landfill, but chemical recycling is even better than that. You know that we have mechanical cycle resistance, like the PET bottles, for example, where you collect the PET bottles and you make new PET bottles out of it. But you have unfortunately also huge fractures of mixed plastics, where you cannot even see what is the original material. And if you would use them in mechanical recycling, you mix them. And you can imagine you have a low quality uh, plastics, which is not good for most of the applications. That's why at the very end, we need to be technology open and we have to use wherever the best stuff is. What can be mechanically recycled in pure circles, do it. What cannot add the chem cycling to even increase the recycling rate. And I think that is something where we work on. We have uh, very clearly targeted until 2025 that 250,000 tons of pyrolysis oil uh, should be used as raw materials. And that with that also replacing fossil raw materials in BSF plants. So that's the way it has to go. All right, Dr. Budemüller, thank you very much. I think we are uh, at the end of this very interesting and insightful um, yeah, conversation and keynote. Uh, we have achieved to answer almost all the questions, um, which is quite extraordinary. And I would once again like to thank you. Uh, and also, um, yeah, would like to um, end this webinar and say goodbye. Thank you very much, Leopold. All the best to you. Don't let COVID catch you. Be careful. Oh, Stay I, healthy. I will do my best to avoid it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.